Summertime is vacation time. Here in Germany, most car owners still prefer to drive, even to distant holiday destinations. When it comes to road safety, tires are, of course, of paramount importance. More than 50 million are sold each year in Germany alone. It's a multi-billion dollar business. But where do these tires come from? And under what conditions are they produced? The tires of my family car are well past their prime. They're getting old and are a bit brittle. The need to replace them ahead of a family vacation has got me thinking about the origin and sustainability of tires on the market. Reifen Stiebling, a family-run business, is one of the biggest independent dealers in Western Germany. I'd like to buy a set of new summer tires and want some advice. The store stocks the standard brands, they're all good quality. But I have a different question on my mind. Can I tell where a tire was produced? Is that possible? Yes. Made in China, Japan, the Czech Republic, tires are clearly produced all around the world. Are customers interested under what conditions the tires are produced? Very few, to be honest. The customers aren't interested in sustainability, how the tires are produced. For us, it is, of course, an important factor. But very few customers are interested, to be honest. But the sales advisor is convinced that his products meet sustainability standards. So I could buy any of these with a clear conscience. Big name manufacturers place a lot of importance on sustainability. So I think it would be better to stick with them, because you can be sure that they are aware of environmental issues. And so I think you can buy tires with a clear conscience. We want to make our own assessment, so we head off for Southeast Asia. Thailand is the world's biggest producer of natural rubber. More than four million tons of it are harvested on its plantations each year. Over the last 30 years, production here has grown by 300%. Bangkok is the center of the rubber trade. We're meeting journalist V. Interakratuk, who's written extensively about the industry. Even from the car, it's clear what a big role the tire industry plays in Thailand. After all, it's not just natural rubber that is produced here, but many tires are too. They're then shipped around the world in containers but it's not easy to get a glimpse inside the business here. Well, as the rubber industry is uh, play, playing the uh, important role to Thai economy, so um, I think the people in this industry might want to keep some secret with them. So it's quite a bit difficult to, to get information from, from them. Our first stop is in Khao Kamao district, southeast of Bangkok. Large amounts of rubber are grown here. Thanks to V's contacts, we gain access to one of the plantations. The owner inherited the plantation from his parents. <laughs> In the past, this area was rainforest. My parents cleared the whole area and started cultivating it. First they planted rice and sugar cane, but later they switched to rubber. The plantation begins right behind his house. For the first time, we see how rubber is harvested. The rubber latex strips out of an incision in the bark of a tree. It can be harvested in a liquid state or through the addition of vinegar, as they're doing here, to get the rubber to solidify and harvest it in solid pieces. Bao Supat employs more than 50 workers on his plantation. 
Later, we will discover what kind of conditions they live in. Bausipat has just planted new rubber trees, despite a glut on the market that's driven a steady drop in the price per kilo. We used to earn good money with our rubber. But five years ago, the price suddenly plummeted. Now we have to save where we can to get by. If the plantation owner himself is feeling the pinch, what about his workers? On the edge of the plantation, we find their decrepit huts. The workers all come from neighboring Cambodia. They're willing to work for lower wages than Thais. I work 12 hours a day, five days a week. Sometimes more. Night has fallen on Bao Supat's plantation. It's the best time to harvest rubber. The Cambodians are getting ready to go to work. Their night shift starts at 8 p.m. and ends at about 5 in the morning. With just head torches for light, they slice deeper and deeper grooves into the tree trunks to keep the milky latex flowing. Na has been working on the plantation with her family for the past seven years. The 23-year-old can't read or write. I earn very little here, between 4,000 and 5,000 baht a month. For that, I have to work every day and at least four nights. Hard night shifts for a mere 140 euros a month. That's around half of the minimum wage in Thailand, which is itself hardly generous. The family always gathers at five in the morning to eat, but sometimes they have to go without. In the rainy season, we can't work and don't get paid. Then we often don't have anything to eat and have to go hungry. When it gets light, Na's daughter heads off to school. She only gets to see her mother briefly. The rest of the family is going to bed. They own just two mattresses, shared between eight family members. Outside is Na's brother. His job today, spraying herbicide. He's using the extremely toxic product Paraquat, long outlawed in Europe. Da feels safe wearing a mask. What the 25-year-old doesn't realize is that Paraquat can also be absorbed through the skin and can lead to severe kidney, liver, and heart damage. He should by no means be working without protective clothing in shorts, but no one has told him that. Before the harvest, we have to kill the grass with poisonous chemicals, otherwise snakes could hide in the grass between the trees and bite us. This is what it looks like before the herbicide is used, and this is what it looks like afterwards. The chemicals remain in the ground for months, not a single worker here is wearing protective gloves. After the harvest, Boasupat sells his rubber to the woman who controls the trade in the area, a broker. She dictates the price. As tradition has it, he has no right to negotiate. Thank you. 
From here, we send the latex to our partner factory for processing. Then our rubber is sent on to many well-known firms, such as Goodyear, for example. We ask what factory she supplies. She calls to ask whether she can disclose their name, but the company prefers to remain anonymous. Undeterred, we decide to follow a truck. We want to know who processes the rubber. Our journey ends outside the gates of the Taihua Rayong Rubber Factory, which is mainly in Chinese hands. We ask for permission to film, but we're immediately turned away and told in no uncertain terms that a written request is also pointless. From above, it's possible to get an idea of the scale of the factory that supplies the processed commodity to manufacturers worldwide. Then, unexpectedly, we do get a chance to look around a rubber factory, although it's considerably smaller. The owner shows us around. Her company also supplies Tai Hua Rayong rubber, among others, and mainly processes liquid latex. The workers here are Thai, not Cambodian. We ask whether they get the minimum wage of 9,000 baht, around 260 euros. I earn 5,000 baht a month, but when the price of rubber goes up again, I might earn 20,000. They carry on hoping for better times. The minimum wage is 9,000 baht, but these people can never have 9,000 in a month. So. No, because we didn't pay like a daily. We pay on the day that we work. We, like, say, 50-50. What we, buy, we, say, we can sell, like, if we can sell, like, um, 2,000, they get 1,000, we get 1,000 as the owner. So the employees are not employees, but get a share of the profits. It's that easy to undercut Thailand's scanty minimum wage. Behind the factory is the factory's own rubber plantation. Amid the trees, a ramshackle hut. Not far away, we meet an elderly couple collecting rubber. I'm over 80, and I've been working here for 50 years. Back then, the old gentleman was the boss, <laughs> and the plantation was high up in the mountains. Clint Supa and his wife live in grinding poverty. While the tire industry boasts worldwide sales of more than 1.2 billion car tires. We decide to confront the big name tire manufacturers based in Thailand. But Japanese multinational Bridgestone, the world's biggest tire producer, declines our request for an interview. None of the manufacturers are willing to reveal their suppliers. We try the German firm Continental, which has recently opened a new production plant close to the city of Rayong. We contacted them several times before our arrival, asking for an interview, but most requests went unanswered, just like this one. Continental, which is based in Hanover, is the world's fourth biggest tire producer, and so it has a particular responsibility when it comes to determining working conditions in the sector. We hear that the living conditions of people on rubber plantations in neighboring Cambodia are even worse than in Thailand. So we decide to head there. From the capital, Phnom Penh, we travel north. Like in Thailand, there are rubber plantations as far as the eye can see. 
With the help of our interpreter, we try to arrange a visit to a rubber processing plant. We made several written requests for permission to film. And while we don't get that, we are allowed to watch production. We do film using a hidden camera. Here too, the natural rubber is delivered in either solid or liquid form. The people running the factory tell us they supply their product to all parts of the globe. In the season, we have to work from six in the morning to 10 at night, sometimes less when there's nothing to do. The workers are housed on the other side of the street. Often the mothers, fathers, and their older children work together in the factory or on the firm's own plantation. It's a tough life. Factory workers are usually better off than plantation workers. Here they even have their own bathroom and a kitchen of sorts. We normal workers usually earn around $150 a month in the factory for a seven-day week. On top of that, we get this accommodation, free electricity, and 20 kilos of rice a month. In the high season, we sometimes earn $250 a month. We travel on to the Ratanakiri province in northeast Cambodia. Here, many indigenous communities live together in villages and farm the land. One of these villages is Kak, by the Tonle San River. Until recently, the people here worked their fields and lived modestly, but well, in accordance with their own traditions. But those times are over. Their fertile fields were practically stolen from them. Big international companies bought the land from the government, land that had been in the community's hands for generations. Amid the global hunger for natural rubber, the villagers' fields were plowed up to plant rubber trees. Today, the community has lost almost all its land. When they rolled onto our fields with bulldozers, we stood up against them. But we didn't have a chance. They've taken everything from us. Many families have nothing to eat. The village chief and 65-year-old Pu Yan show us their land. Here, where their crops once grew, we find a lunar landscape ready for planting new rubber trees. The company took our fields and graves, and now they've even stripped bare our sacred mountain. The people of Kak refused to work for these new masters on their own fields. Like many other villages, they're demanding the return of their land, but they don't have much hope. In the meantime, new settlements have sprung up on their fields. They house women and men who have moved to the area to work on the rubber plantations. They too live in desperate conditions. <laughs> Every year, the rubber harvest in Cambodia grows by 6 to 7 percent. An end to this growth is not in sight. On the edge of the plantation, the next field is being burned off to clear the vegetation and make space for even more rubber trees, for even more rubber for car tires. 
We've seen enough and fly back to Germany to confront the tire industry with our findings. We try our luck again at Continental Headquarters in Hanover. In 2018, the automotive supplier had a turnover of 44.4 billion euros. No one here wants to be interviewed, but they do at least give a written reply to some of our questions. Continental uses natural commodities conscientiously and develops, promotes, and implements sustainable and responsible sourcing of natural rubber across the value chain. The statement continues. Continental is aware of its responsibility and aims to make an active and responsible contribution to promoting sustainably produced natural rubber. Continental also refers to its code of conduct. Since 2011, all our suppliers have had to agree to abide by our business partner code of conduct. We continue on to Frankfurt, to the German Rubber Manufacturers Association, the WDK. Many tire manufacturers are among its members. It's headquartered in a villa in the city center. Boris Engelhardt is WDK's managing director. The lobby group also has a code of conduct. It sounds good at first. The WDK and its members recognize their social responsibility to their own company, to customers and suppliers, to the environment and to society. The actions of the companies are guided in particular by the values of integrity and fairness. This code of conduct has existed for some time now. It provided the basis for this sustainability charter that stipulates that we're responsible for the people who are employed across this rubber value chain. But we can't influence everything right down to the farmer. How can that be? If we simply tried paying more, for example, then it would reach the first echelon of traders, but there are seven other traders beneath them, so you never reach the farmer in end effect. We showed Boris Engelhardt our footage from the rubber plantations. This is a shootout. That's shocking, it's definitely shocking. I can't find any excuse or explanation for that. We now definitely have to look to the future. Like Continental, the other market leaders, Bridgestone and Michelin, also don't want to give us an interview. We try our luck in Hanau, near Frankfurt, where the world's third biggest tire manufacturer is based. Goodyear. But we have no success here. Goodyear simply responds with a written statement. Goodyear doesn't buy natural rubber from Cambodia. We source less than 5% of our global requirements for natural rubber from Thailand. It goes on. We're committed to the responsible sourcing of raw materials, including natural rubber. The statement continues. We offer retread tires for commercial vehicles and aircraft, reducing the use of natural rubber. But why does Goodyear retread the tires of commercial vehicles and planes and not the tires of private cars, which make up the vast majority of vehicles? We visit Germany's only big retreader for automobiles, Reifen Hinghaus. Here, worn down treads of tires are peeled off and replaced with new ones. If we look at this tire here, we can see only its surface is worn. So essentially, the product is disposed of when only about 20% of it is worn. That's absurd. In Germany, there is no legal obligation to recycle tires. Obeke Julius has to source most of the old tires that he needs from France or Spain. What happens to used tires in Germany? There are various disposal methods, but usually the tires are shredded and supplied to cement works, which burn the tires for fuel. That's the classic method. But now, because we have a surplus of old tires, some cement works have stopped taking them, or instead of paying for them, they get paid to use them as fuel. In Germany, some 200,000 tons of old tires go up in smoke each year, while more and more rubber plantations are being established in Southeast Asia to satisfy the hunger for rubber. 
Of course, the retreading process also requires fresh rubber, but about 70 to 80 percent less than is needed to produce new tires. That's a tire that has been produced in exactly the same way as a new tire. The production steps were identical. We have to fulfill identical legal requirements. We conform to international standards. We have the same speed ratings. These tires have to match up to new ones in every way. Tire retreads have an image problem, as Obika Julius knows all too well. A local authority issued a call for tenders for equipping police vehicles with winter tires, and this call categorically ruled out retreads. And that's even though the government always maintains that it places importance on sustainability. And no one has been able to explain to me to this day what data or facts this decision was based upon. We would also be interested in finding out why police in the city of Recklinghausen decided against retread tires. And here, too, our request for an interview was declined. Instead, they issue a written statement. On emergency callouts, our vehicles face extreme situations. Police cars have to be able to cope with greater strains than normal vehicles on the road. But Recklinghausen police don't say why a retread wouldn't be up to the job. We travel to the northern German state of Schleswig-Holstein, to one of Germany's few independent tire testing laboratories. We have an appointment with an expert, Peter Kleingarn. The police in Recklinghausen say they can't use retreads because they don't meet their high specifications. Can that be true? No, we've been testing new tires for decades now. If a retread is produced from a high-quality worn tire, then it will match the performance of a new tire. And the police and the public in general should consider the environmental and financial arguments in favor of retreads. Nowadays, we can definitely say that modern retread plants in Europe are so advanced that their products can compete with new tires sind so weit, dass, dass sie wirklich den Neureifen äh, äh, Parole bieten können. I decide to go for retreads this time. And I wonder how my workshop will respond. First of all, the tires have to be balanced. 30-30. What does that mean? Basically, they can be easily balanced. There are some big name brands that aren't that good. I'm curious to see how they perform on the road. This time, I've opted for sustainability. I'm also confident they're safe, too. And with peace of mind, I set off on my family vacation.